Hi, very good morning to you. It's June from Afstar. Uh, before we begin uh, talking about this Bill Gates interview at the recent COP28, um, I'd just like to say a big thank you to the, the few people that are supporting us and staying with us during these difficult times of you know, trying to raise funding to continue supplying you know, thoughts and information like we will today and also continue um, the monitoring of the magnetic North Pole and other anomalies associated with natural earth changing events. So I watched this interview with Bill Gates uh, at COP28, which was the recent climate um, talks held in Dubai, and just listening to a few of the things in which he's talking about, I could easily, you know, if I didn't want to choose to think too much about a lot of things, just use simple Occam's razor and get to the simplest point of everything. I mean, we could we could draw just two conclusions using Occam's razor. Is CO2 the cause of climate change? And, of course, the simplest explanation for that is how could it possibly be when it's a trace gas in our atmosphere and most of that trace gas is generated, I'm talking 99.5% or more, is generated by natural occurring uh, degassing from our ocean and our lands. So, you know, Ockham's razor would suggest that, you know, the CO2 is not the cause of climate. But can blaming CO2 be a good way of raising, you know, stealth taxes globally? Well, I was talking about just one particular organisation over the last few months, and I've decided to draw my attention to that organisation because they are the ones that are using global governance to raise money to tackle some of the climate issues and the amount of money that they want to raise is in the region of £500 billion pounds per year. And if you just uh, work that out, you know, do a simple bit of math, um, you know, uh, divide £500 billion every year by 8 billion souls on the planet and then, you know, just work out how much money that ends up being um, uh, pushed on us individually. But then what you have to understand is that that 8 billion people or the 8 billion souls on our earth that that is being uh, drawn from, you have to take into account poor countries that can't uh, financially contribute to um, the United Nations that are not part of the United Nations. And those people that are retirement age that aren't you know, bringing uh, those funds in directly. They will indirectly, of course, but uh, then the ones that aren't working, then you've got uh, the ones that are old enough to work. You know, you cut the number of that 8 billion down significantly. And, you know, the end result is that, you know, individually, uh, we are paying a hell of a lot. And if you add that to, you know, that's just the money that they want to collect from other governments. Now, if you add the money from other stealth taxes, like what we're seeing here in the UK, um, you know, clean air zones, low emission zones that you'll charge for driving your vehicle through, which generate a revenue for the government. And then, you know, all the other avenues of uh, tax that we pay, it's quite substantial. And, um, you know, the burden is ever increased when a new idea is generated, like, you know, let's raise 500 billion and tackle some of the climate issues, you could say, using Occam's razor, that, you know, CO2 being blamed for climate change is not true. But it is true that CO2 that has been blamed for climate change is a good way of raising money. And they're relying on, um, you know, the lack of knowledge in this particular area from the general masses. And that's how, you know, we have... Uh, people that are convinced to the point where, you know, stupidly, we see people super gluing themselves to the roads around uh, the United Kingdom in protests about, you know, company, uh, countries must, like our own, do way more to protect our world in terms of cutting back CO2 because there will be no future for our children. So, you know, that, that's you know, just the level of small thinking that I've been doing, but then I go on to another level of thinking which looks into things a little bit more in detail. 
like. You know, we used to be the Paris, the world here in the United Kingdom. We set precedents for a lot of other countries in the industrial terms. You know, we were, you know, the industrial revolution. This is where it began, you know, in the 1760s. And we had textiles and other manufacturing plants. We manufactured a multitude of cars, trains, ships, you name it. And it was all done here at home. And what's happened um, through, I think, you know, just bad management of some of these big companies at the time, they, they was greedy and decided to export those factories to other third world countries where the labour was much cheaper. You could produce um, a similar product for much considerably less um, uh, final um, outcome. You know, so the car would cost probably £5,000 here to build in the UK. But if you sent that somewhere like China, it could probably come back as a thousand pound. I know that that's exaggerated numbers, but that gives you an idea. And that's what we've seen. And of course, you know, if we've got a bucket of water, using that as the analogy, and you start popping holes in it, and every time the water leaks out one of these holes, it is the actual manufacturing that leaks out of the, the, um, uh, the country as the water, you know, in this analogy, is leaking out of the bucket. And of course, if you don't start, you know, sealing up some of these holes, you can watch this um, inevitably empty the bucket of water. Now, in terms of manufacturing, we're really now not manufacturing a lot. And that will be the same for a lot of other countries, because all other countries have used the business model of exporting or moving the company out to Far East, uh, setting the company up there and exporting the cheap labour. So we end up now here in the UK with a service-based industry, which is bullshit because we don't actually produce nothing. We just offer a service for an amount of money. And, you know, we, we end up with now, you know, um, the services like training, training for absolutely everything. And it's, it's not a surprise that the government haven't come out and said, you will need a license now to wipe your arts. And that's an exaggeration, but... You know, it's just the level of training that you need now for just even the mundane things. This was red tape that never existed, certainly in the 1850s, you know, when we was, you know, getting on with the Industrial Revolution and, you know, producing whatever we wanted. Okay, some of the environments which people was um, working in at those times wasn't as safe, you know, a lot, a lot was learned about the carcinogenic materials that were being used or the um, things like uh, that was used heavily in industry, which is now banned, um, things like, um, well, what's it called, asbestos. And there are, uh, obviously, uh, uh, back in the 1900s, a lot of companies, or the 1920s, that was using asbestos in a lot of products, especially uh, fire-resistant products, which we now know could lead to fibres turning up in lungs, causing lung cancer eventually down the road, which is, you know, by all means a good thing. But back then there wasn't a concern, the material was cheap, and, you know, we could manufacture products that had fire-resistant uh, abilities, like oh, just the one I know of. Uh, there used to be a company in Birmingham uh, called Parkinson Can, and they manufactured uh, ovens for most most of the residents and homes in the UK and it employed, it was a big factory and it employed a lot of people and they used asbestos in the, uh, you know, the linings inside the ovens uh, to prevent that heat setting fire to people's homes. But well, it was later found out down the road that, you know, this was no longer material that should be not even in products, but not even in the domestic homes. And he, even in this property where I live, um, within the last five years, um, it was found that there was a lot of asbestos fascias and soffits that were going around the outside of the property. And the operation to remove them must have cost, um, you know, over £10,000 because they had to put literally a plastic bag all over the property before they removed it. And then we it couldn't even be in the property while it was being uh, moved and there was extraction fans. Uh, decontamination units, all sorts to deal with this problem. 
But like I say, things like that are not a bad problem. What is a bad problem is, um, you know, when we have outsourced most of our manufacturing to third world countries, you end up then with the government not making so much money. So it has to invent ways in which it can still generate the same amount of wealth as it did do when people were working, paying taxes and this, that and the other. And, you know, they have to, because the governments don't manufacture anything, they just collect money, they have to come up with new ways to raise funds and um, try and, um, you know, generate some sort of um, labour force market for, you know, their their um, country uh, residents. So, <clears throat> you know, you can see along the lines of which I've been thinking might be other reasons for, you know, knowingly choosing and selecting CO2 to be the blame for climate change, but also, you know, having like a rainbow or, you know, a silver lining in the clouds come out off the back of that where, you know, you could still keep things ticking along. Um, other areas of raising income could be things like what happened during the pandemic. You know, I know a lot of people would think, well, you know, that's led to now a lot of people being bankrupt. But there were industries that were thriving in the, let's say, or say being in the pharmaceutical or the PPE uh, industries were definitely been um, profiting from that. And the, the thing is, is that, you know, it's, it's always going back to one source, all this money. And, you know, I would, I would say the, the majority of the money goes back now to the parents of China. You know, during the pandemic, most of the PPE, most of the uh, vaccines were actually manufactured in China. But also, you know, all the car manufacturing plants, all the, you know, the pots and pans manufacturers are now in China. Everything, as you know, all comes from China uh, still. A low price, but if we look at what's happening in China, when we look at the skyline in some of these cities, we see that yes, the money has been going back to China, and their their salaries have been slowly creeping up to similar levels that we've got over here in the West. But the problems now are starting to occur there, and even China are looking for you know outsourcing their factories to cheaper industries like now India and other emerging. Um, third world countries or poor countries. Now, we've been talking about these things, but we've not talked about Bill Gates. So let's just talk about one of the aspects that Bill Gates was talking about at COP28. He was talking about uh, these underdeveloped countries um, uh, that are suffering uh, forms of climatic change, and he mentions one of them. Um, in droughts, you know, they can lose the crop because the crops were not better suited for the high climate temperatures that obviously he's saying are due to global warming as a result of CO2. But he has a remedy. He's got a company that gen genetically modifies seeds and can provide seeds that will thrive in a warmer climate. This isn't rocket science and it certainly isn't new. This is something that Monsanto have been doing for a long time, and this is a, what will end be what will be the end result. Sorry, of this is what we've seen over the last fifteen years of Monsanto's work in this field, and that is that these farmers buy the crops. They first of all get into debt. They buy the crop seeds. They plant the crop seeds. They sit there and wait for these seeds to you know, develop in what they believe is going to be a dry forecasted climate. It ends up being a very wet climate. And of course, if you've modified a seed which is going to uh, you know, do better in a hot climate, then it certainly will not do better in also a wetter climate. So, you know, what Manso, Monsanto had a result for that as well. They developed one that could thrive better in a wetter climate. And, of course, same things happen. You know, instead of climate producing a wetter season, which these crops were better suited for, it produced a dry season. Of course, they didn't thrive then. And we're almost in the, the Goldilocks zone here. We've, you know, we're trying out those beds in the bear's house. And, of course, she finds the best one. It's not too hard. It's not too soft. But in this case, it wasn't too wet and it wasn't too dry. And, of course, that looks a lot like 
the seed that has naturally um, gone through evolution over the course of time that it's been on our planet. And that's why it is still around today and not died out, because I'm sure that if all our seeds now was being used to fall a more hotter and drier climate, and we didn't get that sort of climate, then we would have all starved 10 or 15 years ago. So the work he's doing is not new, but there is, I think, a detrimental impact to this, because when then farmers borrow the money to buy the seeds off GM companies, and they put them in the ground, and they fail, and they have a concession of or a concession of failed crops over a certain small amount of time of maybe a year or two, they are bankrupt. And, you know, what I am not kidding you now, if you look at the rates of farmers in these underdeveloped countries that have uh, committed suicide, it's usually on the back of them not being able to cope with the fact that they've lost their lands due to borrowing money against them due to wanting to buy a seed that could deliver a, a, you know, a, a yield which was desirable. And it's basically a gamble. It's nothing more than going to the casino and pulling back on that slot machine, the, the arm, and waiting for the numbers to come in. And, you know, if you are going to play with crop seeds like this, then you, are, you have to know that you are gambling, and it's not a guaranteed uh, result at the end. And, you know, the result could be you taking your life as a, as a course of action led by you losing the lands. And I'm not joking. Um, what Bill Gates is doing is nothing new. He is obviously Muslim on the back of Monsanto now. And, you know, we have crop seeds naturally that have naturally grown in drier areas. And we have crop seeds that have naturally grown in wetter areas. And there is no need to modify them. Just, you know, um, use the ones that have been there all the, all the time, you know, that our natural uh, selection process has produced. And they've been here for thousands of years. And if there was any need for modification via through natural selection, then it would have happened, as we have seen with every biological species on our planet. If it's not supposed to be in the environment it is in, or it's over thriving in that environment, you, you know what, nature takes care of it, it always has done. And, you know, us interfering in these things just gives false hope to people. Um, because climate is one of the things that do ch does change. And it changes in so many ways. Um, you might live in floodplains that haven't flooded for the last 70 years, and then all of a sudden, just like that, overnight, those floods return, and they don't stop returning. And, you know, it was always going to be a flood plain because of its its location and, you know, its properties within the soil that stopped it from, you know, or, or it was never managed right in the first place, you know, with drainage and stuff like that. Uh, the thing is, is that it, re it naturally was a flood plain, and therefore... You shouldn't take it for granted that just because there hasn't been any floods on there for years, that it's always going to remain the same. Because we're seeing, you know, this even in the UK be the case, where people are coming and stuff now. And that's why, you know, small towns and cities, when we have a bit of heavy rain, they flood. And the sewerage systems can't pour up with it. Well, you know, if we're going to continue moving in back into these rainy seasons, where, you know, the sewage systems and the pumping systems can't cope or the drainage can't cope, then this needs to be modified, doesn't it? It needs to be improved. And this is where we see the, the um, you know, the, the, the cracks open that lead to bigger problems. So I don't think, you know, um, um, Mr. Bill Gates's solutions offer real solutions and they can possibly be very detrimental to farmers. But, you know, he will turn up with a smile on his face and offer this solution. His company will obviously make a lot of money. And as a result, you know, um, it could lead to, you know, the detriment of someone taking their lives as a result, as we've seen already the case with Monsanto. And I could talk a lot about Monsanto because I was actually helping someone uh, that was being blamed for 
stealing uh, genetically modified seeds because the uh, pollination had spread over into another field where the crop was. And Monsanto said well, it was because, first of all, you didn't plant a buffer crop uh, around the field where you grew your seeds that you claim are not ours, but we've got the evidence that our seeds are in your field and you're growing them. And therefore, you've broke the law because we painted that technology. Well, the thing is, I said to this guy, is that if you go to the Arctic Circle and start doing cool samples, I wonder exactly how many amongst all the pollen samples you're going to find, you will find also now Monsanto's genetically modified ones. And the point of this is, is that the buffer zone around the field would not stop the pollination flying into that field and pollinating the crops and obviously therefore you know ended up growing in somebody else's food. It's something that can't be contained because if those pollinations can you know if these pollinations can turn up in the Arctic circles then you know it shows that the Egyptian have been travelling um, at these uh, or allow these things to travel a lot further than just a mile or so, let alone what you know is recommended by Monsanto, it can travel pretty much all around the world. And the bad thing about that is, is that, you know, this, these Frankenstein uh, modifications are going to turn up all around the world. And we have already seen this. When I was at the University of Reading, we were studying a particular plant that had leaked out of another university during some trials. And before this particular species of plant uh, was something that uh, would never allow these caterpillars to grow on it for some reason. But the genetically modified one would be like cocaine to them, and we could see that there was even the ones that had just, you know, these seeds had escaped and they'd grown. This plant had grown, and you could see these caterpillars was all over the thing. So, you know, that's a problem because you know, you know, you can get cross natural cross pollination uh, occurring um, in in nature. And when you start introducing, introducing substances that are not natural, uh, then maybe, you know, down the road, you could cause, you know, the extinction of the species that thrived on a crop. And then on that has the ability to do that. And, of course, that species is threatened with extinction. This is some of the, the things that can lead further down the road to crises. Um, another one that, another thing that Bill Gates was talking about is that a particular woman in a uh, underdeveloped world. I think it was in um, Kenya. He was talking about this woman that was breeding chickens, and uh, she managed to crossbreed these chickens with ones that lived in you uh, know more dry area conditions to be the ones that uh, lived in um, lesser dry area conditions, and ended up with a different breed of chicken. She was producing chicken and eggs, and she was so, uh, you know sustained uh, by that. Again, what he, I think he was trying to do is, is that we can have the best of both worlds and he's an example of someone driving that's done it herself. And uh, he was pretty, you know, chuffed with that. You know, obviously what he's doing there is a sales tactic saying that, look, you know, people can naturally do it, but when it comes down to crop seeds and that's a little bit more technical and therefore you need the help and services of my company uh, to give you the, or sell you those seeds. And uh, as a result, you, you will be more profitable, therefore more successful and a lot happier. And uh, it's not the case. And, uh, you know, what a cheeky example it is there with the chickens and this woman in Kenya uh, being successful on what she can. You know, it was like using an example that a child uh, or the child's mentality could understand <laughs> what his business was. That's what he was trying to do. Like a crafty little one. He is. Bill Gates is a guy that has been consuming a lot of land. And I guarantee you this, there is a reason coming for this. Maybe he wants to use his own crop seeds on his own land without interference from, you know, anybody. Maybe that's what it is. But he is buying a lot of the land in the United States and he's agricultural and he's into a lot of different things these days. And, um, you know, I know he classes himself as a philopantrist or whatever it is. I can't get that word. A philopantrist. Oh my God, it's even coming out worse. But he's, he's, he's not. He's not giving away his money. He's putting in a trust fund where he says that this will be uh, shared out between 
a lot of people at some point, but it, it hasn't to this date. But what it, whilst it's in this trust, it's not taxable, so he gets to control his money still, whilst having the, um, you know, the overall scene of where that fund goes and how it gets used. So there's not a lot of flippantry. Fl fl oh my God, I won't butcher that word anymore. <laughs> it just won't come out properly today. Um, so yeah, I just think. Uh, you know, that we should look at other avenues rather than just use an apply our contractor because it is very easy to do that and come up with a very short solution. But, you know, I think when you start to uh, examine things with a microscope lock, it's supposed to be done in science. You come up with possibly other ideas and reasons as to why, you know, we are here where we are and how we arrived here. So I thought I'd share that with you guys. Um, like I say, there's a link down there. You know what we do here at the observatory? Our main business is the magnetic pole reversal. And you certainly won't get that information from anyone else. And uh, I know times are hard for a lot of people. But we've been here for a decade. Uh, we can cut back right down to bare minimums here with term, in terms of funding and still deliver you know, an OK service. So you know, as soon as we get a few people chipping here and there, we can continue. Uh, moving forward down this road and um, like I say there's a link down there, it'd be great if we could see a few people at this time being you know, chipping in and just showing a little bit of support, so I will say what I usually do, you take care of your loved ones as always, bye for now